Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. Zurich is the proud partner supporting this episode. As one of Australia's largest life insurers, Zurich encourages the promotion of positive conversations leading to a more sustainable future for life insurance. Committed to championing financial advice through education and research-led market insights. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and I'm pumped to be here with the eagle, Andrew DeBono. Um, I had Andrew in for a podcast session back when his business was just born. Um, He's been going for about three years based out of Sydney. He's got a team of five with uh, himself and one other advisor. Andrew, great to have you back, buddy. Mate, great to be here again. Can't believe it's been that long already. I couldn't believe it when you told me, mate. It's uh, yeah, time flies when you're having fun and uh, keeping up with the fun, fun world of uh, growing a business and uh, financial services compliance and and all of that fun stuff. But I'm keen to, I'm keen to hear a bit about the journey. Maybe we could start there. And um, you know, three years in, you 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 know, you got your stripes um, working in one of the bigger. Uh, shops around the town, maybe call to go out on your own. Started like like I started my business, just uh, you know, with the with the dream and a prayer, wanting to do things a little bit different and and do it your way, mate. Tell us about that journey and what's changed. Yeah, mate, it's been um, it's been a good good fun uh, tough uh, three years, and um, a few things have changed. It's, it's it's funny how it works out. Like I, I started with zero clients um, to begin with, so that puts a bit of pressure and stress on there uh, from the get-go but but over time as you build up that client base it gets a bit easier a bit easier then you get a new advisor and it gets a bit easier and easier uh, but then you've got all the other challenges like the compliance challenges that have happened over the last couple of years so we've been managed or we've managed to sort of get through all of those um, and then also decided after the first 12 months that the original license that I picked um, or licensee that I picked wasn't the right one for me so did a change then as well so um, yeah, the journey has had a few ups and downs, but but overall it's been uh, pretty successful. A couple of IFA awards um, at the back end of last year. We got newcomer advisor of the year for for Christian, and um, client servicing company of the year as well, which was a bit of a shock. But um, but I guess it just shows and, and acknowledges all the hard work that we've put into it. Um, we'll, we'll reap some rewards. Mate, it's great to to get that recognition, and it's great to see companies doing things a bit differently. I. Uh, like I say, very similar story to how I started the business back in the day and can fully identify that, you know, the, the good thing when you start a business from scratch is that your overheads are pretty low, um, but it certainly lights fire that when you, you know, you, you've got no clients, no ongoing income to work with, that you've got to, you know, make sure that you've got that clear message, that you, you know, got a, a compelling offer so that you can, um, yeah, build that base, build the the income, and and ultimately grow your business. In the early days, where did where did your clients come from, and and has that changed, or how has that changed over time? Yeah, I I think um, the early days it was like all about that networking with different like client or sorry, I guess partners. So like trying to meet out with different brokers, different. Like, accountants, property guys, just to try and get a, a wider funnel. And I did try and partner a little bit with um, with a mortgage broking firm, which is really, really successful at the moment or, or, or now, um, who specialised in, um, in doing loans for um, lawyers. Um, but we quickly learned that um, Andrew De Bono and Peak Wealth Management and lawyers just don't work out. And it's just not a good mix. <laughs> just not a good mix. So we, we had to sort of stop that at, at some point or a couple of months afterwards. And then I just had to focus on going for either cold leads. So I used to do a lot of um, LinkedIn marketing, a lot of videos, reaching out to people, going to these little, I guess, little coffee catch-ups with people. And uh, bit by bit, I, I picked up a nice little client base, uh, built it up. And then after that, that's when I felt like I probably got a bit more confidence, but also I had put enough um 
put enough sort of hands in different pies to try and get um, get clients from other businesses. So other accountants and, and mortgage brokers and, and the, the lead flow just kept going on and on. And then once you start doing a good job, it's um, yeah referrals. So you get existing client referrals, um, a couple old clients and, um, and things like that. And it just kept, kept building up. Yeah, nice. And so at the moment, what's the sort of breakdown where your your clients would come from? Do you, sorry to put you on the spot. I probably could have prepped you with that yeah. question. Yeah, oh, look, it'd be pretty easy to, to see that. I'd probably say like 90% of them would be referrals from either existing like partners, like business partners or existing clients. Uh, the remaining 10%, we just get a few random ones every now and again where they come through via the Google like SEO um search they'll see us on linkedin or they'll see something and they'll they'll reach up out to us uh, back in the last year we had a big influx when we got those awards in the linkedin marketing and social media marketing we had a fair few people reaching out uh, and that's still flowed on you we've had a couple more earlier this year where people have reached out they've seen us on on the social medias and um and thought they'd catch up um, i'm not sure there might be an, another business with similar name to peak where they've um either Googled <laughs> them and, and maybe we snuck it in but um uh, that's the community of seo that's it. You, yeah, you'll take it. You'll take it when it's there for yeah. sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was so, asking forgiveness, not permission. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And it, sometimes it goes the other way. So if you're on the right exactly. side of it, then that's a that's a win for sure. Um, one thing that I feel like you've done pretty well. I, I know that you work. You you build a um, partnership with an accounting firm, which is an accounting firm that we refer our clients into um as well and, and you mentioned sort of early days with the lawyer thing and then just having um building different relationships with centers of influence that's something that it's a code that i've never really cracked in, in our business but it is something that we've been giving a little bit more thought and attention to in the last little bit what what are the sort of the lessons of, of, of that journey that you picked up or what do you think the, the keys are to doing that in a way that where the juice is actually worth the squeeze because i know for me like you said that you um with that one particular partner you're getting clients and they're just not the right clients in from a whether it's from a profile like psychographic perspective or whatever the case may be that it, it's sometimes hardest and especially and i was actually having this conversation on the podcast the other day with another um another advisor that you sort of feel this level of obligation when you get a referral in from a partner the two give them a fair bit of love because you don't want to just go, oh, well, no, you know, you're not the right fit. Whereas if someone comes and, you know, makes inquiries for your website and they're clearly not right, you just say, hey, you're not, re you're not really right. Yeah. So what would you say? What, what, what's what's important there and, and what are the lessons learned through that journey for you guys? Yeah, I think, um, I think one of the most important parts is really around that, uh, the cultural aspect of it, like identifying that your business and, and your cultural sort of beliefs around your business and, and the way you treat clients or the service you provide um, does marry up and, and match with the, the other business you're trying to partner with. If you can get that, um, if you get that alignment or those synergies there, then that's obviously like, the first step of success. Um, the second bit, I think, which which I spent a fair bit of time on before doing any of these, um, or not the first one, obviously, the, the more the second one with this accounting practice, um, is is really understanding what their process is, how they go about doing things. Um, we're not a sales orientated business where it's just constant, like you, know, you meet someone, you, you send a service agreement straight away and, and fingers crossed they come on board. Um, mm -hmm. We're more of a slower, you know, slow and steady sort of a, approach where we meet them a couple of times before we put the service agreement in. So we do invest a bit more time on it, um, but where our, our cut through is probably a little bit better. So understanding with that, you know, with the, the business that you're trying to partner with, understanding what their process is, how they work with it, how much time they spend with their clients before trying to do different things and then try and marry up a similar service offering on, on our end as well. So um, they're probably the two biggest things which I've found have worked out the best. But then also you've got to look at the client demographic of what they work with and, and what you want to work with. Yeah, absolutely. What you're willing to work with what you want to work with as well. So um, Yes. Yeah, and I think yeah, it's increasing, increasingly hard for financial advice businesses to be all things to all people that you sort of build your yeah. process if you want to drive any level of efficiency to – deliver a certain solution that needs to fit with the people that you work with underneath it. If you're trying to do an SMSF client one day, a 30 year old accumulator another day, a business owner the next day, it can be really difficult. I've noticed for us and for our t for your team as well, because they end up yeah. every all these out of the box processes and tasks that can be, can be challenging. 
On the server solution, I'm interested to hear how that's evolved in in the time since you started the business. Because I know that at that time we were chatting, and it was you were. You, it sounds like you're now much clearer on who it is that you want to be working with. Um, in terms of the how, though, the the you know practically what you're doing and how you're structuring it, how has that changed and evolved? Yeah, I think um, so. Back when we initially started, obviously you're pretty limited on cash flow um, and, and not having much cash in there, so you're not really using um, all the tools available to you in the industry. Like, and, and we're pretty fortunate um, that there are a fair few tools in there, so we weren't using like things like the My Prosperity um, uh, part. Um, even the CRM wasn't the best. We didn't have Mondays like we've got now, um, and, and a couple of other things, but. Um, I think over time, as we've sort of gotten more cash flow, we've been able to reinvest in our service offering. And um, a lot of things that we, um, a lot of things that we implement are, are all about trying to make sure we can create more efficiencies in not just the business, but also the client interaction. So um, initially, it was always about trying to meet up with people, trying to catch up with them frequently, get on the phone with them all the time, um, and try and I kind of build a really good relationship to keep them and, and work with them for a long term. Whereas now it's all about trying to be efficient and helping them and adding the same amount of value um, by spending less time. With yeah. So so we've tried to change it a little bit and it's been working really, really well. So clients understand that we're busy as well. And, and I recognize that um, the clients understand that we're busy as well and yeah. they don't need to meet up with us every single time. So if we can deliver a bit of information or, or a bit of advice to them in a, in a much, uh, much easier method, Mm. Um, then that's what we've been doing. Yeah, definitely. And I think that you, I know that I felt at the start of the business that you feel like, yeah, you sort of compelled to do a meeting sometimes because that seems like the way. But yeah, clients are busy and the increasingly the more sometimes yeah. it's sort of forced on you that you just don't have the capacity and then you realize how much can be done without following the traditional ways. But I know like we get a ton of clients and sometimes they'll have questions and you might start to write an email or think about the response but i just fire up bloom and like record a video and it might go for yeah. a minute or a minute and a half and go there yeah, i had a client the other day about trustee trustee for his estate and he's asking this thing and i just sent it on and and this is a you know client with the with like a 15 million dollar asset position on paying us on one of our top tiers of service and they, they were stoked at the end. They're like, oh, that was good. I could sit down with the wife at the end of the day and, um, you know, we can decide on that piece together and it's just meet them where they are, which thankfully the technology is making a little bit easier for us. But um, Yeah, and I've, yeah. Also, I've also found doing that, so we've done the Loom thing a couple of times as well, and doing that is um, it, it's sort of – um, it doesn't let or it doesn't allow many more questions to come afterwards. If you just type an email, you sort of answer their questions, then they'll usually come back with a whole bunch more questions. Mm. So doing the video, you can just articulate it so much better and uh, explain it so much better, in my opinion, or maybe that's just me. But um, <laughs> it's, it's much better, and they can just watch it whenever they want, and then they're not going to come back to you and bother you with a whole bunch of other questions. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and so uh, I think it's a, it's efficiency for us, but then it's efficiency in them and getting their their issues exactly. resolved as well. Yeah, Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, like, now your business has grown, you know, a fair bit in the last few years. How do you tackle your planning for, like, your strategic planning for the business and um, what are you focused on looking forward from here? Yeah, so I'm uh, pretty fortunate. We um, So part of the licence, um, this sort of a community involves as, as part of the licence or, or through Vinark and, and Gavin. Um, and it's really good that we do different activities around the business planning and about, around solving uh, problems in businesses or in financial planning businesses. So a whole bunch of us get together on a quarterly basis, um, different topics to discuss that. Um, but on top of that, then we've got one-on-one -on -one sessions with our, with our business coach and um, we're going through um, you know, some of the pain points and, and articulating how we can try and improve them. So um, it's been probably the biggest focus for me over the last sort of six months, um, mm. probably a bit less actually, probably the last sort of yeah, four to five months. Um, that, that lockdown period at the back end of last year, I felt like I was just chasing my tail consistently. Um, I caught up. I did one of those um, little, little course with um, yeah, Vanessa Bennett. Um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, she's so a little course with her. Yeah, she's awesome. 
caught up with her and we, we went through a few different things that we can try and look at outsourcing and take a bit more off my plate so I do have a bit more time to do things. Um, that's worked out really well and we're starting to reap the real rewards of that. But for me, it's always just sort of dedicating the time um, on the business to help mm. grow it, further advance it, get more improvements, streamline things. Um, we use mondays.com for all our processes. So instead of using the CRM, which is always pretty clunky, um, yes. we use Monday, so it's just nice and colourful. Everyone can see where everything's up to. Um, everyone can, yeah, knows what they need to do for the day and it just, yeah, seamless seamless process. Yeah, we, we use Monday a fair bit as well and the, the, the ease of use compared to some of the, the other tech solutions that are out there where you've just got this yeah. massive list of stuff is, oh, um, yeah. you know, it, it's pretty overwhelming and it's also hard to prioritise as well, but I think it's all those efficiency gains Um uh, helpful. Vanessa's a total legend that she, she's she got some great sort of hacks to, to drive more efficiencies um, yeah. and productivity as well, like across a whole bunch of different levels. So I think it's you need every advantage um, with that stuff for sure. With the the team growth, how, how do you tackle that? Like how do you plan around that? I feel like there's no right way, but as I've been asking because we're we've been sort of hiring you know, for what seems like the last couple of years since the, the back of COVID. And um, yeah. I think like I've been in a position like you before where it's like you're just getting things coming from everywhere. And I think that that's the part of business. It's the double-edged sword, I suppose. It's the part that I really enjoy. But you go, there's so many things and you see as a business owner that you go, oh, I've got, I could be doing marketing like this and there's an opportunity there. Or if I had another advisor, then I could, yeah. I could get them to look after this so I could focus more on this other thing. How, how do you tackle that in your business? Yeah, I um, it's a tough one, isn't it? And it's, it's like a, yeah, I think you said it before, it's a bit of a double-edged sword um, because you're, you're trying to get someone, you don't want to get them too late where it's like everyone's chasing their tail and they come in and it's not a, it's not a fun environment because everyone's stressed mm. And panicking. Yeah, you don't want to get them too early because it's like, oh, they're just sitting there, you know, playing, playing on their their phone uh, because it's yeah, like, no work to and do. costing you so money like, as well. Yeah, exactly, and it costs you heaps of money. Yeah, so so you want to try and find the right balance. Um, the way I sort of view it is, as soon as I am getting tasks back to me. Um, or tasks that are coming back to me um, which are a bit delayed or, or they're not there at the right time, like they're, even if it's just a day delay, I look and go, all right, we need we need another solution. So we need another another person to help in the team and, and help out. And then when you for what you end up finding or what I've ended up finding is that if I do bring them on a little bit early, I'll go back and look at all the stuff that I'm doing on a daily basis and go, what else can I outsource? What else can I not do on my task list anymore? And then, mm-hmm. so what we do bring the new person on, it's all right, well, you're, you're going to help out for a bit of overflow here and a bit of overflow here, but also you're going to do this part. This is your domain um, and I'll, I'll coach you a bit on that and let's get that going. Absolutely. So, yeah, there's always there's always going to be something. I think as I don't know, as a business owner, I've found that as, as it grows, there's always something else that pops up, another task, another role as compliance changes, new legislation, mm-hmm. all this stuff. Something's always going to pop up which uh, there's going to be a time where you don't want to do it anymore. So you can outsource. Yeah. Yeah. There's always, it's, that's a good thing about a growing business as well is that everybody's sort of upskilling, including yourself. And then you would go, well, you can add more value to the business, to the clients, to the solution by doing the next thing. And then you go, well, now we can bring someone else in to do those things, which are, might still be very valuable, but they're just lower value. Um, and then everyone's on that that journey, which I think is helpful when you're building teams because ultimately everyone wants to be developing. And this is the thing that I've noticed from having a lot of sort of candidate interviews over the last little bit that where a lot of people get frustrated is if they are just pinned into a role and there is no, they don't have that opportunity or or room for growing and, and developing their skills. I think especially with what we're seeing in there, the great resignation or the talent drought or whatever it is that they they're calling it for younger people and i um i find that younger team members are more attracted to our business like we're younger clients younger team already that they want all of those things too and um yeah it's interesting it still blows me away in some cases we see these established businesses and they're just not built for that and they just want people to just punch in and punch out and just um do that thing and expect them to do it for the next 10 years like yeah it doesn't sound like a a fun time 
I have been pretty fortunate though as well. I haven't had to replace anyone yet. So that's probably going to be uh, one of my biggest learning curves or, or challenges that will, will eventuate at some point. Hopefully it never does, but um, I'm sure everyone goes through that at some point. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that it's, uh, I always say to new people when they join our team that it would be selfish or, or unrealistic for me to think that people's journeys won't take them beyond our business. Obviously, we we do everything that we can to ensure that that doesn't happen for the right people in supporting them, but ultimately it does. And I think, yeah, for me, that's been a, been a lot of learnings. We've had we've had some people that have just as as time has gone on, they've realised that the the pathway that they thought um, they wanted to go into was probably less aligned with where they wanted to be, um, yeah. which is unfortunate. But like that's just people right especially if you've got younger people that still are still finding their feet in their career or earlier on like the first 10 15 years 20 years of your career that there's a lot of different pathways in front of you we've also had people that i think were good that we probably didn't support in the right way that um ended up doing similar things at, at other places and i think when that happens it's a real learning and it really for for me it forced us to go okay well what what did happen there and and let's do a diagnostic to unpack like the, the, so you often can't save the situation like once something has happened but you go well, what can we learn so that when someone is aligned with the culture of the business the vision of the business what the clients want what we need and how do we shape things in a way that what they want to do and for me one of the biggest things and it sounds like a simple thing but our business coach has got this um calls it RPM, which I can't actually remember exactly what that stands for now, but it's essentially like you do this three-year plan with the team and go, okay, well, in three years, like what sort of work do you want to be doing? What um, uh, what do you want your focus to be? What sort of income do you want to be earning? What sort of, um, yeah, well, what sort of impact do you want to be having? Actually, it's results, RPM, results plan, massive action, because it's like, what are the results? Yeah. And then the big thing for, for, and the super helpful thing for me is go, well, what action will you take to make that happen? Because it's great to go, well, I want to earn 250K working four days a week and um, I only want to do, you know, X, Y, Z roles or tasks yeah. or whatever. But you go, well, obviously this is a business and there needs to be a commercial, like a way that that can work commercially. So what what is your plan to make that something that is going to benefit you and benefit us and benefit everybody as well? Yeah. And it's sort of really tipped the table that it seems like a simple thing. Like one, you're just asking people what they want, but sometimes we're so focused on trying to give people what they want that we don't always ask them what they actually want yeah, yeah. and say, okay, well, you want that. How are we going to do it? And then... Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, I've found that to be helpful. We do that with our onshore, offshore team. Like we just um, did a team planning session. Then it gives you things to talk to them about when you're doing your check-ins with them um, periodically. So yeah. I found that that is a, is a helpful part in keeping them engaged and working towards what it is that they actually want as opposed to like where the where you want them to go um yeah as well exactly. and again i think the good thing about a growing business is that there's lots of different opportunities that if someone wants to play in the compliance space versus the advice space or the investment management space there's probably a way that you can make that happen um yes certainly as well. yeah um what what does a typical week look like for you and how do you you mentioned that you use monday for a bit of your task management stuff but how what does a week look like and how do you actually carve that up and manage your time i'm usually in the office early i'm, I'm a bit of an early riser i um i'm usually in here sort of between seven and eight o'clock every every day depending on um on what football's being played um, <laughs> sometimes i'll be in a little bit later if there's um, a champions league game on during the week um, and liverpool's playing but most of the time, yeah, it's between seven and eight o'clock. I'm in the office. I've tried to, so typical day. So we usually have our, so the first like couple of hours is just getting a couple of tasks off that I can pass on to, to the team. So it's things that I don't need to do or a bit of that workflow process where I can just go into it and, and pass it on. Um, then we have our, a daily huddle. So um, with the offshore guys, um, we catch up with them at 10 a.m. So it's about 7 a.m. their time. Um, so we catch up for 
uh, catch up with him at 10 a.m. where we have a bit of a chat, um, see how everyone went every, yeah, see how they went the day before, um, what they're up to this week, anything holding them back, anything we can do. A um, bit of an update as well on the new clients front with the advisor. So how's that going? Um, how'd you get off this meeting? You know, what's this prospect looking like or anything I can help and, and vice versa or anything you want to run on bias? That usually goes for about 15 to 20 minutes, we find. Then from then, it's just, you know, getting on, speaking to clients, a couple of meetings. Um, I make a, a decent effort to go to the gym at uh, 2 p.m. So I'll do that three days a week. Uh, then the other two days, I'll do other forms of exercise after work. Um, so I try and get that exercise in every single day. I was going to um, say, the guns are looking great. The guns, yeah, they're getting there, eh? <laughs> Penny's <laughs> thumbs disappeared. <laughs> um but um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much the day, and then we just have meetings uh, throughout the day. Uh, I think it's been a lot better since the, the post COVID environment, where clients are willing to catch up with you during work hours. Um, mm. Whereas traditionally, or when I first started, it was a lot of after hours meetings. So yep. we're doing you know six o'clock, six thirty p.m. meetings, where that's a lot less frequent these days. There is a couple of clients yeah. here and there, but the majority are meeting up with us in during work hours because they're either working from home so they can sneak a little hour in or sneak a 45-minute meeting in and um, and have a bit of a chat. Yeah. Um, that's about it. And then, yeah, sort of once a, a month I, I catch up with uh, with Gavin and talk a bit more about the business and different ways we can improve it uh, than quarterly meetings. But, um, yeah, it's a typical week for us. I think the biggest thing for us, we just keep that consistency on the, the 10 a.m. huddles. Yes. Um, see everyone's up to. That's just, it's power. I find it so powerful. And it just gets my day, you know, not so much started, but it just gets me going, oh, shit, I need to do this, this, and this to pass on to these people so that I'm not holding up that, holding them up on their role and vice versa. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about the remote team because I know that you've got a few staff offshore. And I think for yeah. us, we've found that that cadence of meetings is something that's super helpful. Any other key hacks that you that you find makes it, it easier for you to work with the, with the distributed team? Yeah, um, one of the other things I've found is, and this was part of doing that, uh, that they were doing that little course with um, or that little program with Vanessa, was oh. getting off my emails. So what we found then was all of our like Monday's notifications and, and processes were hitting our emails. And then you look mm. at your email, then you'll see like an ad from, I don't know, something and you, you click on that and you have a look and you get distracted pretty quickly, right? Yeah. And and then you're just focusing on your emails to do your workflow processes. But then what we did is we um, we linked Mondays to Slack. Yeah. So you get a notification on Slack, have a look at that and update anything from there. So okay. then we're spending less time on our emails. So we like sort of designate a bit of time on our emails. Mm. Um, and then we're not getting as distracted as much from different ads and, and other stuff that comes through there. <laughs> Mate, you've got to do anything you can because it's so it's hard. It's easy enough to distract yourself just with the work, let alone with um, everything else that's out there. But I yeah. think that that's the key, yeah, for us. I've got the team onto doing these Pomodoros. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's like no, I haven't heard of that one. Um, Pomodoro, Pomodoro technique is like you do a 20 minutes of focus to some sort of I don't know thing. But it's like you do 20 minutes focused time. So I use that for myself. It's got like a little timer that you can have as a plug-in on your, on your web browser. Yeah. But it's amazing when you do it, especially if I haven't done it. Sometimes I get slack off and don't do it for a little while. And then you go back to it. And because you know that that's, you're like supposed to be hyper-focused in that time, I'm particularly mindful when I do distract myself. And it's like I'll start doing something and I'm like, oh, I'll just check on this thing or I'll just what did that person say about that thing again? Or I'll do that. I'll go to do it. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 come back, come back to it. And it's amazing how much you just wander um, when you're doing it. So I think, yeah, yeah. that's uh, that sounds like something that would, yeah, helpful. Benefit me. And then the other thing was I, I realized back in the last year, I was just wasting so much time going to grab a coffee. Not, I'm not saying going out of the office and walking down the cafe or anything, but like even just getting up and going into like, so I'm in one of those shared offices at work club. But even just going up there and just putting a pot in and, and getting a coffee, and I've just cut out the coffee slightly. So like I just haven't been having coffee. So I'm not, I'm finding myself just saying saying my desk and actually doing so much more work than when I'm going to grab a coffee. So you go grab a coffee, then you see some just a shared office. You see someone, you have a little bit of a chat. Before you know it, 15, 20 minutes has passed, and it's like, oh shit, I've got to do yeah. this. And we're going to meeting coming up now, and yeah, nice. <laughs> 
It's um, I can talk about efficiency hacks all day, but uh, yeah, I but, I, but I won't. Um, so my last question for you is: if you could go back to yourself day one, you know, you fire up the uh, the website, you know, pull down the shingle, and give them one piece of advice. Give yourself one piece of advice. What would that be? Whew, it's a tough one, eh? I um, I think I've been pretty fortunate. I've been pretty fortunate around uh, doing the right things and, and really taking advice from other peers in the um, in the industry. Uh, but I think the one thing is that I didn't do initially was probably uh, the licensing side of things, like really, really do my research around what's going to be the best license for me as a small business uh, mm. to try and grow my business and not have that, that pressure or that stress around, you know, costs or, or restrictions on technology as well. Um, so that was probably the biggest thing that I would um, that I would have probably changed in my first year from day one by far. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. And it's also hard when you haven't gone down that path as well to not know, That's like you don't realise how much it can impact when you haven't been the yeah. driver of other decisions like that as well. But um, definitely a big one and it's it's painful to to make those changes as well. So um, good advice for, for all the people about to kick off that are listening in. Yeah, certainly. Mate, Andrew, thank you so much for sharing your insights, mate. Great to see you kicking goals. I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah, look forward to it, mate. Hopefully it's not um, three years down the track. It's, uh... <laughs> well, they put me back in the chair, so uh, sooner yeah, rather good. than later. Yeah. So see you. All right, guys. Yeah.